Uh, we should get started. I have to apologize. Okay, so sort of, you know, this is planned, but midway through the section, I'll be handing off to, to John, uh, which is great. I'll be going straight to the airport, though, so that will be the end of the road for me for summer school, and I regret that because it's been great. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm happy that I got to be here for the uh, time that I did. And uh, what I will do in this half section is uh, kind of wrap up on that very last thing we talked about, which is, so we talked about mergers from all sorts of, you know, aspects. Um, and the very last thing is to talk about how do you do merger analysis when both prices and products can adjust. And we started that discussion by mentioning that to begin with, even before you switch to a less competitive regime, it could be that the market uh, somehow ends up with a uh, inefficient set of products. Uh, and in principle, a move to a less competitive regime, when it comes to prices, you expect prices to go up, <laughs> consumers to be hurt. But when it comes to issues of product quality, variety, you may either get more or less of that, and that may either be good or bad in terms of fixing some inefficiency that was already there. So there are all these sort of complicated possibilities, and the theory mostly gives us guidance about the fact that things could go either way, which on the one hand is a nice guidepost for empirical work because then you say, okay, the theory tells me that, I, that the merger could be either good or bad in terms of product variety, say, and then I'm going to estimate some model that would tell me in practice what will happen. I would also try to qualify that statement a little bit after we see some of this because I think that while the theory tells us that things could go either way, I think that we still need also maybe a little bit more theory work that will provide even more specific information about what exactly should we look for in the data, even in raw data that will be consistent with either over-provision or under-provision of, of uh, quality, variety, etc. So we know that things could go wrong and then we estimate a model and we come up with an answer, but I think that still, especially the thing that could be developed is that a lot of these theory papers, including the ones that I reviewed, they look at a monopoly or monopolistic competition, but what about oligopoly? You know, things become much more complicated and there is still, uh, I think, some way to go in terms of understanding these issues. In any case, the two applications that I thought of covering, and I'll only cover the first one, um, uh, the following, so the Ganska, Masio, and Syme, uh, both of these papers have uh, firms choosing a product portfolio uh, among a set of feasible products and prices in a two-stage game. First stage, you, you commit to your product choices. Second stage, you commit to your pricing. Uh, there are some methodological differences. I will cover this paper because it is specifically about mergers. In terms of methodology, I think that these papers offer somewhat complementary strategies for dealing with some of the, um, with some of the um, um, econometric or uh, methodological challenges that we have uh, discussed. So, for example, okay, so first of all, the main difference is that here you have a set of horizontally differentiated product variants. This paper is about ice cream, and the firm needs to decide the portfolio of ice cream flavors that it's going to uh, essentially offer to consumers via retailers, of course. This paper is about a vertically differentiated product portfolio, and you need to decide, you know, do, do I offer to consumers only the most high-end product, uh, some mid-range options, do I offer a very low-end option, how is that determined in, in equilibrium and all that. In terms of dealing with some of the econometric issues, this paper is going to assume that shocks to fixed costs are private information. That's going to smooth out the multiple equilibria issue. In principle, we could have one equilibrium in which uh, only uh, Ruven offers uh, some uh, particular ice cream flavor, and I don't, and some other equilibrium in which this is reversed. Um, but when shocks to private costs are, are private information, that tends to alleviate that issue, which is uh, one of the problems. Um, and also, the, the, there are going to be assumptions here that do away with the selection problem, which is going to come up in the second paper. So I want to remind you that, you know, sample selection problem, so what is that all about? So there is the issue of multiple equilibria. That's not going to come up in, in the paper on ice cream. The sample selection issue, I got to talk about it very briefly. When, when we finished up, I want to give you an intuitive example of what might go wrong if you ignore th this problem. So here we are going to have some firms that choose which varieties of ice cream to offer. 
And some particular varieties are going to, offer, are going to be offered everywhere in every market, you know, some plain vanilla <laughs> type thing that everybody wants. Um, but there are going to be some ice cream flavors that are going to be offered only in some markets and not in some other markets. Okay? So that's actually good for identification because when the product is offered, that's going to generate some upper bound on how high the fixed cost of offering that product in that market could have been. And when a product is not offered, that's going to generate a lower bound on the same quantity. We'll see that. Um, but it also generates some selection problem. It could be that I get those bounds wrong. And the intuition is the following. Uh, you know, think about some very extreme examples. Think about some ice cream flavor that, n that really nobody wants, except for there is a very small set of markets where they really love that thing. Okay, think about something that, you know, I don't know, mosquito flavored ice cream, okay? <laughs> Nobody wants that. But there are a few localities maybe that appreciate that stuff. And so what's going to happen is that you never see the product except in these places. And whenever you see it, it's remarkably popular because these guys love it. Okay? So if you ignore selection, you might think that you know, when you estimate the utility function and you have a coefficient on whether or not there are you know, mosquitoes in ice cream, that coefficient is going to, give a lot of, is going to be estimated to be positive and significant, and it would seem like people just really love it, but really it was not in the utility coefficient, it was in the unobserved shock. And that could mislead us to think that if we just offered this wonderful ice cream elsewhere, it will be very popular, but in fact it wouldn't. So that would also mess up the estimation of the bounds, because as I make those, to estimate the bounds, I need to make these counterfactuals, I need to say, well, I don't see it being offered here. If it were offered, I can simulate how much profits it would garner, it means that fixed costs have to be at least that high, otherwise the product would have been offered. But I'm going to overestimate those variable profits because I would erroneously think that that is a very nice ice cream. Okay. So we will see how in this paper the issue is, uh, in, does not arise. We will see why it does not arise. Here is an example of a paper where it does, and we mentioned that when the issue does arise, it's very complicated to fix. And so I don't know if I'll have time to talk about uh, specifically how this is dealt with in this paper, probably not. Let's talk about this paper. So the main questions are how do changes in demand, number one, and market structure, namely mergers, affect the set of products offered in equilibrium and their prices? I'm going to focus on the merger stuff, okay? But really, this framework allows you to consider any change in the economic environment. Demand is shifting out or in uh, regulation, all sorts of things uh, can be taken into account. Then you can simulate what products, what prices we would end up observing in the market. Uh, but here there is, there is policy relevance. So again, something that I mentioned super briefly last time. So in another segment, they are going to look at premium ice cream, but there are some other segments of the market. And in one of these other segments, uh, one of the firms involved here uh, uh, proposed the merger with uh, Nestle. And the merger was opposed by the Federal Trade Commission. And specifically, the Federal Trade Commission, in opposing the merger, said uh, this merger would uh, harm consumers once by raising prices, and, but also by reducing consumer choice. So the FTC took the position that the merger would actually reduce product variety, which is not obvious you know, before you do the, the analysis. Yes. Okay, so the question was, uh, you know, could it be that the reason, you know, some of the reasons why we offer or do not offer certain types of products, could that uh, be associated with the sort of incomplete information on part of the firms regarding certain products? So here, the fundamental assumption in these papers would be that there is a feasible set of products. The firm is aware of them. Constructing that feasible set for the firm, that's part of the challenge for these papers. Because in principle, if we allowed that feasible set to include anything, then that, that would be very, very complicated. But here we are going to commit. Basically, what you typically see is that 
you know, people who do this type of research, they see the sort of totality of flavors that were offered anywhere and they say this is the feasible set. Uh, it is kind of difficult to analyze here something that never appeared or also to formally analyze something that the firms were not aware of. So information would add another layer of complexity which is assumed away here. All right. So here we want to do um, the, you know, some sort of merger simulation somewhat along the lines. We already did merger simulation and somehow my stuff is still here. Okay. Uh, but that was only about, you know, how prices change with fixed products. How can we also allow products to change? Um, so you know, I'm, I'm not sort of giving a very detailed uh, description of, uh, of, uh, of the paper, but uh, what you need to accomplish this fundamentally. First of all, you need the type of data that you need to estimate a differentiated product demand system, just like in the sort of, you know, more standard merger simulation, the first step was to estimate consumer preferences. And then you can use that to evaluate how firms would price, anticipating how consumers would respond, and then think about how firms can reach equilibrium. Previously in prices, now in prices and product choices. What's going to be particularly clear now is that now you really want to have a rich random coefficient type model where you allow for consumer heterogeneity along possibly multiple dimensions. Why? Because if this is about, you know, understanding firms' incentives to provide variety and or sometimes contrasting those with the incentives of a social planner, then both the firm and the planner need to know to what extent consumers value variety, to what extent are consumers heterogeneous. If all consumers have very similar tastes, we can offer all of them the ice cream that they like the most and we're done. But uh, here we would like to estimate empirically, evaluate empirically just how important variety is to consumers. Um, in terms of data, so they have weekly data spanning uh, 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 two months. They aggregate to the monthly uh, level. They end up having a sufficient number of observations. They're going to have prices, quantities, some characteristics. But, you know, with products like ice cream, typically when you see people estimating demand for something like this, you don't necessarily put in characteristics of ice cream, but mostly brand dummies and things of that nature, because it is kind of difficult to capture exactly what is different across the different products. But they are going to have some information also on characteristics like, you know, how many sugar, uh, you know, how much uh, sugar goes into the product. That's going to be useful for shifting cost also. Uh, again, so the, the analysis focus on the vanilla category, which is large, about 25% of uh, the market. And within that, on the premium non-diet category, again, the super premium is where that blocked or opposed merger by the FTC uh, took place. But there are additional ones. Typically, you focus on one segment and, you know, you can always say, well, you know, why do we focus on something so specific? How can we then tell if what we learned is general or, or not? But I think it's just a reflection of the basic trade-off that, uh, you know, a greater degree of focus allows me to obtain a better understanding of the institutional features. So the demand model can be better tailored to what's actually happening and you don't end up mixing over many, many different things. So there is an obvious trade-off uh, in this entire uh, literature. All right, so how does this market look like? There are really only two ice cream makers that, that can be considered as national players in that segment, which are the uh, Breyers and Dreyers, okay? Uh, it's in the paper, okay? <laughs> That's what it says. Um, but what's interesting is that in different sort of regional markets, they encounter different regional players. There are some very important regional players that produce ice cream, and some of them are very good. Uh, and so, you know, these companies that have national presence, they encounter different competitive conditions in these different markets that are sort of imposed on them by the presence of these other guys. Uh, and, and here we start to see, you know, the set of restrictions that we are going to place on this game. We said, in the first stage, everybody chooses flavors. In the second stage, everybody chooses prices. But really, that's going to be a huge game in all these papers. So then you start to put some restrictions. Okay, so first of all, okay, that we'll see probably in the next uh, slide. Um, there are some flavors that everybody offers, and so those are going to be defined as staples, and it will be fixed in the model that we offer these 
staples. Okay, it's uh, you know think about you know just the regular you know vanilla ice cream. Everybody is going to offer that. So that's one restriction. It allows us to consider endogenous choices on a smaller set of products, and that's going to be useful for computational reasons. But then also, what do we do with these regional players? So what the authors choose to do is actually to fix the flavor offerings by these regional players, focusing on the strategic flavor choices by the national players only. Uh, so you could say, well, this is re restrictive, but you might also uh, think that, um, you know, in terms of the first order questions, the policy questions are all about, you know, what happens if these big guys merge? Uh, and not so much, uh, you know, the product choices of, of, of these other players, which are smaller, they have a smaller set of uh, flavors that they offer to begin with, and so maybe it's not a big omission to take their product offerings as fixed. Um, the pricing choices of these regional players are also taken as given, uh, which is maybe, uh, which goes a little bit further, <laughs> okay? And technically it's not, you know, I, c I can see why this helps. Uh, since you already need to compute price equilibria, at least in my experience, allowing a few more firms to, to adjust their prices in this equilibrium doesn't really add more than a few milliseconds to the computation, but there might have been other reasons why this was done. It wasn't super clear to me, but again, the regional players' decisions are taken as given, and this would actually be perfectly fine if those were like a fringe of competitive players. Then they price at marginal cost, they don't really respond to anything that happens, and then th this assumption is actually a good description of what's happening. So uh, one reason might be uh, increased multiplicity if you let the regional players play, which would have made it much harder. Okay, yeah, so, so, so I believe that in terms of fixing the flavor offerings. Yeah. So when it comes to the multiplicity, it's actually a delicate point. So this builds on the original idea of SIME 2006 of using the private information to alleviate multiple equilibria, but really formally, this only really solves the problem for small games. When you have bigger games, the private information is not guaranteed to do away with the multiple equilibria, but the authors show in simulations that they never find another equilibrium, so it appears to help. And then maybe indeed if they make the game bigger in terms of allowing additional product choices, that would definitely not help. In terms of prices, I think, you know, unique equilibrium in prices typically does obtain. So it is still maybe a bit uh, surprising, but again, I, I don't think it's a big omission in terms of the economic environment. Yes, and again, this issue of staples versus optional flavors, right? Mosquito flavored ice cream, optional. Right. In terms of the model, again, I'm only giving kind of a very brief tour. I'm leaving out a lot of stuff. But we're going to have firms, namely brands, uh, denoted by B. And in, in the two-stage game, again, each firm chooses the set of offered flavors from a predetermined feasible set. Offering each of the optional flavors results in, if, in fixed costs. Okay, that's similar to the structure in these theory papers that we looked at, at Friday, on Friday. All these models look the same. We have a two-stage game. In the first stage, we locate ourselves, we decide whether to enter the market or not, what products to have, and we pay some fixed costs. And then in the second stage, we only do pricing. And that's how the theory literature started. It also turned out to be remarkably useful for the empirical work because the second stage is what people have been doing all along. Um, you know, estimating demand and doing counterfactuals with pricing decisions, giving a fixed set of products. So the second stage is very familiar, and then you have to figure out what this first stage adds. And it adds the ability to make inference on fixed costs. And I gave a tiny bit of intuition already for why. And then in the second stage, okay, here we are going to actually fix the behavior. We are going to assume differentiated Bertrand price competition. All of the flavors that are in the market, producers are just going to set their prices simultaneously, which is a very familiar model. Excellent. So, so the authors actually have to engage in that discussion. Uh, you know, so is it really, you, you know, maybe one could have said, is there really fixed cost in offering yet another flavor of this vanilla ice cream? And so they actually uh, mentioned a couple of things. It's, it's on one of the slides that's coming up, but I, would, I can already address it. If I forget something, you know, one of the things we'll see it. But they talk about, for instance, uh, some, um, some sort of foregone economies of scale, for instance. If I just make the same thing in a larger quantity, 
um, you know, that's, that might be more efficient production-wise than producing sort of smaller quantities of these differentiated things. Uh, there might be some slotting fees that you need to pay retailers to put more, th more options on their shelf. Um, again, so these brands, so this is, an, this is a vertical industry here. Upstream we have these brayers and drayers and the regional players, but downstream we have retailers that need to put these things on, on the shelf. And you might need to compensate them in order for, you know, to conquer more shelf space and things of that nature. And also maybe potentially smaller issues, uh, packaging, branding, etc. Or maybe learning how to make this new flavor. Here it's not really going to be the learning. These products already exist, but maybe just supporting it and making sure that, uh, you know, that all these different flavors come out as planned, etc. So there might be... They do have to engage in the discussion, and, and I think that they do convince us that there are some reasons to, to expect there, there to be fixed cost. But that's, a, that's actually a very good point, because I think that any paper that looks at this should start by explaining why we expect there to be fixed cost. Uh, you know, otherwise, you know, it might seem like you know, we're, ju we're just estimating things uh, for fun. Um, okay, so again, some flavors or staples, those are always offered by construction, they might also be associated with fixed costs, but we would never be able to identify them if, if they're always offered, then there is no useful variation there that tells me that sometimes fixed cost was too high and sometimes it wasn't. But when it comes to the optional flavors, so these are the optional uh, uh, flavors, uh, the reverse, these are the optional flavors, one uh, through OB, and the firm ends up having a product choice vector so this is brand B in some local market T. It has product choice vector. So these are binary <laughs> indicators that take the value of one if this particular flavor was offered and zero otherwise. And so you actually have uh, quite a few choices here. If you have uh, 10 such optional flavors, then the number of product choice portfolios that you could have introduced is two to the power of 10. Okay, these numbers uh, expand fairly quickly, which explains two things. First of all, why you want to make as many sort of restrictions on this game at the get-go, okay? Why you want to say that there are staples, for instance, so that you reduce the number of optional flavors, okay? That's very important. Otherwise, this, this thing just explodes. Although there is some issue here that, you know, for the purpose of estimating the model, uh, it's okay. Because quite often for estimation, we only use sort of one-shot deviations from what you will observe to offer. And that's not so bad. But then when we want to do counterfactuals, then now I have to think about all the different things that I could have done. If there is a huge set of product choices that I could have introduced, uh, that's not going to be helpful for that stage. Okay. So the demand model is indeed a random coefficient uh, uh, logit uh, with the utility of consumer K uh, from brand B's flavor F in market T, okay, being the following. So what do we have here? X is a vector of observed product characteristics, but again, these are mostly going to be firm slash flavor fixed effects. Okay, not so much, you know, how much protein you have in this ice cream, but really just a fixed effect for this flavor. Um, beta K are the utility coefficients that consumers attribute to these different characteristics, and the point is that these are specific to consumer K. Namely, we, are, we allow for random coefficients. We have consumer heterogeneity in preferences. Some consumers are going to be very loyal to particular brands and flavors, and some consumers um, uh, would not. So we want to have that heterogeneity. Again, that informs the basic question of how much variety will be provided, should be provided, and so forth. Um, PB is the price. There is an assumption here which is uh, basically driven by the data, which is that for these different vanilla flavors within the premium category, prices are going to be the same for a given brand. So Breyers is just going to charge the same price for all of them. That's the empirical reality. And of course, if that is the case, that can help. And, and then we have these sort of, um, and the, the price sensitivity is also heterogeneous. We've had some discussion last week about if you wanted to have just one random coefficient, this should be the one. But here, you know, this is one of the cases where you really want to have a lot, you know, very rich description of consumer heterogeneity. 
And here are the, uh, these are just some completely idiosyncratic shocks. Yes? So we're assuming that uh, rare plain vanilla and rare plain vanilla are uh, exactly the same, right? No, because we're going to have the Breyer's fixed effect. Okay, so yes, that's important. Okay, that's actually a great point, and I think that, you know, the second paper on these slides, which I will <laughs> not get to, um, actually does that. So there the differentiation is in terms of one particular product characteristic, not a brand dummy. Actually, here you might think that you could run into some of the issues that Ariel talked about on Tuesday, which was the reason to go to these type of demand models to begin with, that you want to move from product space to characteristic space to reduce the, the dimensionality of the, of the problem. I think what happens again, what you often see in papers on ice cream, soft drinks, etc., is that you don't have a huge number of, of brands. And so you can actually just put brand fixed effects. That does away with a lot of concerns about all sorts of unobserved qualities of these brands. And so you don't run into a dimensionality problem in that respect, or you just make it go away somehow. So it's a strategic choice, but you're absolutely right. Yes? In terms of the random coefficients, you mean? Yes. yes. Okay. So in this, okay. So the question was, uh, does my can my price sensitivity be correlated with my taste towards some particular flavor? And so this is something that is often not included in models. Uh, we see uh, we see really. I think it is the exception rather than the norm uh, to allow for these correlations. Although the models definitely allow for it. So this is one of those papers that do not allow for these correlations, the second paper also does not allow for them. Uh, so the short answer is no. Is there any reality? No. No. Is there any real coefficient? Is there a real correlation when it goes to like, real demand? I would imagine so. And uh, you know, I think that this is one of the challenges that we always face. We are trying to reduce, we're trying to reduce the computational burden. We can definitely include such correlations and there are you know pretty famous papers that do that it doesn't involve a conceptual change to the estimation at all but then you do have to worry sometimes about am i going to identify those or not you have to think about what type of variation would be there to pick that up it adds another layer of realism that sometimes we we allow it and sometimes we don't and that's that's my most honest response region fixed effects uh, I, th I, th I think they are, actually. We'll see. We, we will not see a lot of tables here, but we will see the results table. I think that there are regional fixed effects as well, but let's, let's, let's wait and see, because I don't remember. Uh, but I think that they do. All right. So this is all about stage two. This is like what we normally do without a product entry stage. And a couple of comments on what's not here. Okay, so if you have been using these models, then you would expect some KSI, some other Greek letter to appear here, okay? You would expect some KSI BFT to show up, which will be a shock, an unobserved taste shock for this brand, with this flavor, in this market, okay? This is where those, you know, all sorts of idiosyncrasies that are not at the level of the consumer, those are the epsilons, but, you know, imagine that in some small town, people really like some particular flavor of some particular brand, maybe, you know, maybe because of some historical reason or any other reason. And so this paper doesn't have them. Or there might have been a particularly effective propo promotional effort for the particular flavor in some particular market. Now, okay, so first of all, they're not there. What would have happened if they were there? Sort of if we were to acknowledge that they exist? A couple of things. First of all, price endogeneity, as usual. Okay, but the demand estimation, this entire literature developed in part in order to address that with instruments, so we, we know how to deal with that. So I don't think that's why we don't have them. Okay? The second problem that arises is exactly selection. Okay? I already gave the intuition for that in the beginning. What if I only see this flavor in markets that for some K 
Kesai related reason, you know, really like them. Then I would, you know, if I'm missing that, I would think that, you know, that flavor is just very popular everywhere. And that would bias my results. And so what they basically say, so they are aware of these issues. And what they say is that for, pra for practical reasons, they assume that because they have a lot of brand and flavor fixed effects that, you know, that they control for a sufficient uh, set of things so that they can ignore uh, KC. But they are very open about it. They say this is a practical limitation. And I would say definitely this is, I think this is the first paper that did this product portfolio thing with this two-stage game. And it's not a big literature until now. <laughs> okay, there aren't that many papers. So definitely, you know, if you make a big step forward, it's definitely fine not to fix all problems in one framework and you can allow it for some later papers to deal with some of these additional issues. Can you give an example of a market where this selection thing is not a problem? Ooh, huh? um, so is this selection problem always there? So formally, I would say it could be. But I think that, you know, in terms of, of practicalities and in terms of research questions too, sometimes, you know, you might be willing to ignore it. I think that Ariel wants to respond. Yeah. The other thing is that you want to, in counterfactuals, you want to know what were to happen if I were to offer this product in this market. And then if you have these errors that you, then if I need to think about what was the error of this product that was not there, that becomes the issue. And in fact, the second paper, the computer paper, deals with selection in estimation, but does it in a way that partially identifies the distribution of, of fixed costs. So then what happens is that you go to counterfactuals and, and this is where, where, where you're, you're, you're not done because you didn't estimate the distribution of fixed costs sort of in a, in a point identified fashion so that you can now draw from it. What you end up having is a partially identified distribution of fixed costs. How do you draw from a partially identified distribution? So a lot of interesting issues come up in this, in this work and for that reason probably you know, some papers just put it aside which I think is you know, depending on what you, accomplish, what you try to accomplish in the paper, I think might be reasonable, okay? All right, uh, some, some of these details perhaps are, are less uh, are crucial, but just in a, in, a, you know, in a word. So we also model constant marginal costs. Uh, the, the marginal cost will be assumed identical across flavors of the same brand. There is some unobserved component, but it's common to all flavors, that's the assumption. And so you end up seeing it for the flavors that were introduced. So here you don't have a selection problem in that sense. And then you have the fixed costs. And those capture all the things that we have talked about, foregone economies of scale, inventory management, that might be important. If I just need to ship out one flavor ice cream, then inventory management is easier than if I need to sort of supply different types and make sure that I have you know, ample amounts of them in different logistics centers, etc. Advertising, okay, maybe if I want to make these different flavors visible, I need to uh, do more advertising, slotting fees to retailers, packaging and labeling. Now here, the, f the substantial assumption here is that only, f only the, the firm, Breyers or Dreyers, actually knows its own fixed cost and the other firm does not. That would allow these authors to rely on some Bayesian Nash equilibrium of this game, where all that this game would specify some probability. So with respect to every, um, it will be a mixed uh, strategy equilibrium. So we mentioned that there is a set of product portfolios that I could bring to market. And the sort of fixed point of that equilibrium is a probability distribution with which I offer these different brands. And in equilibrium, all I know, I don't know what brands the other guy would offer, but I know the probability distribution with which the other player mixes over their own portfolio of brands. And this is all rationalized by 
the fact that you have these, uh, this private information uh, uh, fixed cost. I don't know precisely what shocks my rival will draw from, from their distribution. I have to sort of you know, mix over the, these things and you, and you end up with a mixed uh, strategy equilibrium. This is just a technical point, but if, if there's a distribution of privately known fixed costs, you could imagine the firms using pure strategies. That is, there, there, there's a, for each set of fixed costs, I produce some varieties, some mm -hmm. some varieties <coughs> with probability one. But from the from the other firm's point of view. It's a, it's a random variable because they don't know what my costs are. Right. But, uh, okay, so you think, you think that that would have been an, an, an alternative solution concept to the same I'm not underlying? Sure why, I'm not, I, I don't know the paper, but I'm not sure why they didn't do it that way. That's, that's the normal way of, of handling Bayesian equilibria with... Uh, Sorry? Essentially, that's what they do. Is that what they did? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's not really a mixed match. It's not an expansion. Yeah, it's a pure strategy equilibrium where the type They know their own the type, type and nobody enough. else knows the other. Yeah. 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 Okay. No, they, they know their own type for sure. Yeah. So uh, I think you just missed it. It's okay. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, Are you saying that even their type, they randomize? Let, let, let me show you what's on the slides because okay. that I didn't make up. <laughs> I, maybe sort of, you know, verbally I'm making stuff up as I go along. It's possible, but, uh, or that I forgot. But let's see. All right, so this is what they do. Okay, second stage, they set prices to maximize their profits. All right, this is the markup per sort of unit. And here they sum over optional, you know, staples, whatever, and deduct their fixed costs. Once you estimated the demand system, you can back out these markup terms, as we have seen, and you can come up with your variable profits given any portfolio choice and given the portfolio choice of any other firm. Um, yeah, so I'm, t I'm kind of trying to breeze through it, number one, because my flight to Shanghai is <laughs> kind of, you know, creeping up, uh, but, and we, we did a little bit of this in previous papers, that's why I thought I can, but, okay, here I'm, I'm choosing the price for all of my flavors, it's going to be the same price, so that simplifies the problem somewhat, but then this is the unit markup that I will, that I will make, price minus marginal cost. And here I'm basically summing over the quantities that I would sell from all these flavors. So here I'm summing over the market shares of the optional flavors and the market shares of the staples. Multiplying by market size, that gives me quantity. So here I have price minus marginal cost. That is unit profit times quantity. And here I'm deducting the fixed cost. The fixed cost, the fixed cost summed over everything that, that, that I offer. All right, so now we basically have an expected profit from choosing some portfolio. So I'm choosing some portfolio now, given the portfolio that I've chosen, I have an expected profit function. What is the expectation taken over the portfolios that would be offered by the other guys? So far still everything we say is consistent with what you are saying, yeah. okay? But this, but this implies, okay, this is, this is why <laughs> I'm, still, uh, I'm still arguing for a mixed strategy equilibrium. This implies a marginal probability that this portfolio will be chosen. And that's what they are going to take to data. Because they are saying, this is from an ex-ante perspective. Okay, you're right. Once I draw my fixed cost, I know what I'm going to do. But they are going to use the conditions that are sort of from an ex-ante perspective saying, Right. And also the, the econometrician doesn't know the fixed costs. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 yeah, I I I could be I could I could be wrong on this. Although what they what they take that looks right. Yeah, no, but what they take no no, this this is correct. But what they take to what they take to estimation, basically this is going to be some sort of a likelihood estimation where I'm basically saying, I see that you offer this portfolio, and these were the ex-ante 
probability that you would do so. In terms of terminology, I, I, I trust you guys more than myself, okay? So absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry about that. The issue is that you don't see the fixed costs, but the agent did. The agent did, only for themselves. Absolutely. absolutely, I agree. Okay, okay. I have nine and a half hours to think about this uh, <laughs> later today. All right, so, um, so Bayesian, okay, we talked about this. <laughs> um, how do you estimate this? I'm going to push forward, but how do you estimate this? this? This is actually very intuitive for demand. It's the usual idea we are going to match observed market shares to those predicted by the model. This is what we always do to generate demand side moments. That's not going to be any different here. Uh, marginal cost parameters are going to be estimated by matching observed pricing decisions to those predicted by the model from the pricing first order conditions, which I didn't put on the slides, but we've seen them multiple times already. And then how do you get the fixed cost parameters? This comes from the observed choice of the portfolio, okay? To get marginal cost, I'm using the observed pricing decisions given products, but to get fixed cost, now I say, you know, you could have chosen any number of portfolios. I see that you chose this one. I'm going to match that to the predictions of the model and that matching will give me fixed cost. The fixed cost will have to rationalize why you offered this portfolio and not all these sort of huge set of other portfolios, okay? You could estimate it together for increased efficiency. They estimate it separately for tractability. All right, this is very intuitive. Uh, these are the demand and marginal cost estimates. So you can see that they have, uh, you know, they have the price sensitivity, but then they also have a standard deviation on that, okay? Different consumers have sort of different price sensitivities. They have a Breyers and Dreyers constants. So this says how much, how loyal you are to the, to the brand. I'm going to suppress additional questions. I'm sorry, I just I have to wrap up in two slides and... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I, I think it's an important, uh, at least, what in reality generates the distribution on the fixed costs? Okay, I already discussed what generates the fixed costs, and what generates the distribution so of fixed costs on top of that? that allow you to, to, to the observed product positioning choices. The observed choices to offer one portfolio and not the other, that is a, a revealed preference type information that tells me that, for instance, if I say that Elhanan didn't offer some flavor, maybe the fixed cost was too high. Okay, that's the intuition. But you have to see uh, the same firm operating. In yes, I see them operating in different regional markets and over time. Absolutely. You know things like the size of the market, the influence of people in the market, and they kind of shift the balance. All right. Uh, we're either all going to Shanghai or I push forward. <laughs> so. Brand loyalty, that also has a distribution, okay? Again, and then we have, you know, we have monthly dummies and uh, I'm looking for the regional dummies. Yeah, there you go. Midwest dummy, South dummy, all right. I knew they were here somewhere, okay? You estimate demand. You estimate uh, the normal distribution parameters of the estimated log fixed cost. We just dis discussed what identifies them in practice though you put it in some sort of a, of, a, of a likelihood framework and you estimate a normal distribution and then you can translate it into mean standard deviations of the fixed costs themselves. So there are fixed cost parameters and then there are fixed costs which are economically the interesting part. And so what you can see here are the mean estimates for the Breyers homemade vanilla. This is how much it costs them in dollars to put one additional flavor of this type uh, on the shelf. And for the other things, notice that the standard deviations on these are really large. And, uh, you know, they don't discuss it in the paper. I suspect that maybe when you don't capture some aspects of demand heterogeneity across these local markets because there are no KSIs, maybe that just shows up, it inflates some other part of the model, maybe the fixed cost, that is a guess of mine. I don't know if that's true or not. But again, I think it's, it's perfectly reasonable. And then what do they do? How do product offerings and prices respond to? I'm going to talk about this, changes in market structure. They're going to simulate a merger between Breyers and Dreyers, and they're going to compare the predictions between two types of analysis. The one we talked about last week, when only prices adjust and product offerings are fixed, versus the situation where both offerings and prices adjust post-merger. And this is basically, right, we're going to focus on this thing. Here you see what happens in the observed duopoly. This is, this is observed data on prices, profits, etc. 
uh, and the number of brands that are offered, number of flavors, so on average two, say. And here you have the simulated equilibrium under the merger. But here is the simulated equilibrium when products are fixed, and here is the simulated equilibrium of the bigger game that allows product variety to fix, to, to change as well. You might notice, you know, prices don't change by much. Uh, but the interesting point here, I think, really, is that the number of flavors decreases. And they actually translate it uh, into welfare numbers, and, you know, it might appear like small effects, but it actually, it actually means that allowing for this additional dimension of merger analysis, in this case, is highly informative. It does tell us that the merger is worse than we would have thought had we not allowed products to adjust. And again, this is not something that we knew before we wrote this paper, because theory didn't tell us necessarily whether this merger would lead to more or less product variance. It could go either way. The empirical work in this case is kind of consistent with what the FTC said, which is that mergers, albeit in another market, would not only hurt consumers via increased prices, but would also decrease uh, variety. I believe this is my cue. So I do apologize for uh, finishing up in a bit of a rushed uh, fashion, uh, but uh, yeah, I have to leave. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thanks also, th thanks John and Ali for the flexibility with my travel times. <laughs>